People come to me and they tell me, Matt, how are you so good at building space stations? Can you help me build a space station? And I'm like, no worries. Here's a video of me building a space station. Million views! But then they say to me, Matt, that's all well and good, but I don't know how to rendezvous in orbit. How do I make a space station without that? And I say, no worries, my friend. Here's a space station where it's all flat packed, you just put it in orbit and undock all the parts and stick them together. But then they tell me, Matt, that's all well and good, but I'm a busy person and I can't be bothered to redock things together and reassemble. And I say, no worries, my friend. I'll build a space station which doesn't even need to be undocked or redocked or reassembled. You just launch it and then it's just, it's just done. And that is what we're doing today. So here we are getting ourselves into our first, well, into our, into a stable curb in orbit. Expending the last of the fuel from those massive side tanks needed to haul this thing into space. We needed quite a big launch assembly to get this thing into orbit just because not only is it horrendously um, un-aerodynamic, what's the word for that? <laughs> um, it's also incredibly heavy, not only because of all the crew modules there you can see, but you can see in the middle sort of tucked away, um, you can see there's that orange tank there, that's going to be a full orange tank so we can use this for refueling missions and now you can see him making a maneuver note to Joule. The reason for this is that we are now in Kerbin orbit and at this point if I had chosen to just have this as a Kerbin space station the video would now be over. So I thought I'd make things a little bit harder and put this in orbit around Elu instead. So yeah that's basically it. So we can just use the last of the fuel from our ascent booster to kick our apoapsis up nice and high before switching over to the nuclear stage for the rest of the mission. So as per tradition for my really heavy spacecrafts that use nuclear engines, we're going to be doing more than one burn at periapsis to get our trajectory on an interplanetary course. The reason for this being that we can use the Oberth effect to increase our efficiency. The way this works is that you're travelling much faster at periapsis than you are at apoapsis, but the thrust of your engines is the same, so you end up travelling a longer distance per second of burn time. So, you know, when you take the formula of energy equals force times distance, um, you end up adding more energy to your orbit the longer you spend burning at periapsis. And that's how the Oberth effect works. So let's just talk about this craft a little bit more um, whilst we're on the map screen and you can't see it. What a great time to start this topic. Oh, let's just talk about our destination. Um, we obviously, we're going to Elu, which is the seventh and furthest planet from the sun most of the time. Um, I say most of the time because sometimes its orbit intersects jewels and passes in front of it, but uh, the planets are locked at a 3 2 resonance and are at different inclinations, so that ensures that they just, they'll never collide. Um, now, Elu is very similar to the Mun, with just 3.5% more gravity, and it is very similar in size. And in addition to this, it also has no atmosphere, which is uh, unlike its real-life analogue, Pluto, or its physical uh, counterpart, the ice moon Europa, which are both two things in the real solar system. Um, these two bodies do have pretty tenuous atmospheres. Now, Elu, um, you may notice, now we can talk about the graph, you can see those big arms uh, sticking out the side with all our solar panels on. We need a lot of them because Elu's relatively large distance from the sun uh, reduces solar panels uh, to approximately 4% what they would normally be at Elu periapsis and only 1.4% at Elu apoapsis. Uh, when compared to the value seen at Kerbin. So we need a lot of solar panels and we also have a lot of RTGs to generate some power without the need for solar energy. So if you are going to Elu, I would definitely, you need an RTG really. And so our Kerbin escape is complete. We'll have to do a small course correction to actually get ourselves on a good dual gravity assist. In fact, we're gonna be doing not only a dual gravity assist, but also a Tylo gravity assist as well, just so we can uh, more easily get an Elu encounter. So if we just make a maneuver note there, uh, when it comes to making maneuver nodes and planning gravity assists, my main advice is, I mean, yeah, you could plan it if you wanted to, um, but I tend to just make a maneuver node and just, you know, keep faffing around and messing around with maneuver nodes until I can get an encounter that works. Now, I did start my mission, or I launched my rocket when a dual transfer window was open, so I did time up to the correct point before starting this mission, which is why I was able to very easily get a dual encounter just there. Uh, if you want to do this, there are mods available like Kerbal Alarm Clock is the obvious one. Uh, and here you are, just see, we're just faffing around with our maneuver nose, trying to get our gravity assists to work properly. The unfortunate downside of stock KSP is that the default, well, the stock uh, maneuver, no maneuver node maker is very, it's quite cumbersome. It's good for sort of basic burns. When we're doing very precise gravity assists, uh, you can see that it's just very hard to get things accurate. So in the end, I just spent a lot of time faffing around. We can skip ahead a little bit, <coughs> trying to get our Elu encounter, but... Um, as you can see, I can never quite get it perfect, so what I ended up doing was leaving it as it was and just decided I'll make another burn once we've done this one, just because 
it's not going to be very easy to do it in stock. Now we could use a mod like Precise Node, and I think I do have that installed on this save, but for the sake of trying to keep things stocked because some people, you know, either can't be bothered to run mods or they don't have PCs that can run mods or they play on console, I'll just say, ah, we'll just we'll keep it stock. So as you can see, this thing turns about as fast as a merry-go-round. I did speed up this footage, I was trying to use... That was time, that's the mod time control just there, I was seeing if I can make things go a little bit faster, but, you know, whatever. So, it's going to be quite a short burn, 109.5 meters per second, which, you know, we've still got 2,500 meters per second in total, so we have loads of fuel left over, and, oh, there we go, you can see we massively overshot that. See, then we're talking about burns like this, we're talking very, very precise amounts. What I actually did was I turned on RCS, I did very, very small puffs just to try and get... Our encounter. So you, the way you would do this is you hit R to enable RCS, and then you use H and N. H is forwards, and N is backwards for the RCS thrusters. That's a little tip if you want to try and do very precise burns. Now the RCS thrusters are present on this ship because, although we're not doing any docking or anything, it has a lander on board. And the reason for this is that we can do surface returns not only to Elu's surface, but we can also go and visit our base that we put there on a previous video. But there we are, getting our manoeuvre node there. It's going to be quite a short burn again, only 150 metres per second. And there we are, we're going to get a nice Elu periapsis. So first things first, we need to go ahead and finish our gravity assisted jewel. So we can just time warp ahead and do that. So let's have a look at this happening. So the way gravity assists work, it does sound quite counterintuitive. We're just essentially getting free energy. The reason for this, we're actually stealing some of Jules' orbital energy and transferring it to our spacecraft. So, yes, technically, in theory, Jules is dropping in orbit, isn't it? It's losing orbital energy as we do this. But, I mean, given the absolutely insane difference in terms of mass between Jules and the spacecraft, and Tylo, I guess, because we're doing a Tylo assist, um, it's essentially completely negligible. In fact, the game doesn't even can take this into account, and neither does NASA in real life. So, but that's how gravity assists work. So there we are, goodbye Jewel. Quite a brief encounter, but whatever. If you're trying to recreate this mission and you haven't already, you could have just done some of the science that we could have done there. So use the lab experiments on board using this craft, which is available for download in the description. Um, as well as the in the description, actually, there's also a music video version, which is about three and a half minutes long for those of you that are a bit impatient. Although you have managed to sit through seven and a half minutes of this so far, so well done for sticking here. But uh, yeah, here we are getting our final encounter set up. It was a bit glitched a little bit there, wasn't quite going through the orbital line, but whatever. Performing a very small burn once again, and we have about two kilometers left over of Delta V just to perform our ELU circularization. Now, if you noticed on the map, our periapsis around the sun is very high, and this is thanks to our dual encounter, well, our dual gravity assist. We have quite a high periapsis there. Um, it's a mistake to try and get an ELU encounter, but we have a periapsis that's still very much at Kerbin level because it's going to take an absolutely insane amount of fuel to circularize, which is fine, I guess, but if you do a dual, if you do a dual assist, or something like that, then it helps force your periapsis up and it makes circularizing at ELU far cheaper. So there we go, we can just circularize. I actually made a small mistake there. I'm coming in uh, on the other side of ELU, so on the wrong side of ELU, so I made a quick correction there, just skipping through all again. You want to be coming in um, so your orbit is going in the same direction as ELU's rotation. Now, the reason for this is because the craft that we have has a small lander on board which has enough fuel to do an ELU surface return, which is the main reason we have that orange tank so we can refuel the lander and keep doing surface missions. And so in order to try and conserve as much fuel as possible, it will be far more efficient to do the lander's gravity turns when it's trying to get into orbit um, with the rotation of the planet rather than against the rotation of the planet. And that's the same when, when you launch from Kerbin, that's the reason uh, we always launch uh, eastward because that's the same direction that Kerbin spins. So we are now pretty much captured at ELU just forcing our apoapsis nice and low. We're going to actually lower our orbit quite a bit. We're also going to change the inclination because at the moment we're still we're still quite tilted. It'd be nice to keep this as equatorial as possible because then we'll be passing directly over the surface base layer there so we can do uh, nice little surface return missions to it and things uh, and and well that's it and it's just a bit more satisfies my OCD a little bit more if we do it like this way so we'll just do a few minor burns at apoapsis and periapsis in order to get this thing as low as possible I'm going to aim for about 10,000 you can actually go quite quite low uh, in terms of ELU because it's very flat there aren't any mountains really so you can have a nice low orbit without having to worry about colliding with the ground so you can see me just doing time warp, just a very small burn, time warping to the other side, doing another burn, then just gradually just forcing us down. You have to do, it takes a little bit of patience, but it doesn't actually take that long, and it's quite um, 
ends up making things a little bit nicer. So, so yeah, it's not really like essential or necessary to have a perfectly symmetrical circular orbit, but I think it's just a nice thing to aim for since we've got way more delta V than we need. We still got uh, 1,376 according to Kerbal Engineer at this point, so you know, way more. And then we can just see we can do a quick time warp to make sure we're not going to hit the ground, and we've got loads and loads and loads of clearance. So now comes the task of deorbiting those side boosters. Now they don't have probe cores, but what we can do is we can just fire up the nuclear engines very slightly, initiate a spin to make sure they get clear, and then they'll just start burning retrograde until they hit the surface. In fact, what we could do to make sure this happens, we can just uh, switch to one of them uh, using these square bracket keys. And what we can actually do, this is kind of, it feels like this is kind of exploity, but we can actually still time warp, and then when we drop out of time warp, the engine will start burning again. So if when you do this, your engine does flip around the wrong way, just initiate some time warp until it's facing the right way around again and it will start doing. Or you could just try and freak the Kraken out and make it self-destruct like I just did there. <laughs> but we can just quickly do a check and yeah, it's hit the ground. So that's a way of doing it. I probably should have put docking ports on them so the lander could deorbit them, but I forgot. But here we are, here is the big moment. Now I set up all the radiators and solar panels to all be toggled using an action group key. So there's the, well, there's the secondary solar panels and here go the main ones. So we have about 20,000 units of electric charge on this thing, so we should be pretty good for electricity, not only because we've got those big panels, but we have the RTGs, so hopefully we'll never uh, have any problems with electricity. And you can see the lander there as well, so we can give that a quick test as well. So uh, Thompwin Kerman is getting ready for his mission down to the surface, so we can choose the... I think it would be nice to go and visit the surface base on Elu because because why not? So we'll start burning retrograde. We'll set that as a target so it just appears on the mini-map. Though you do have to make sure that the nav ball doesn't just switch things to target mode, like it has just there. I had to quickly switch it back to surface mode. And yeah, the way I'd recommend doing this is just by doing quick saves and things. You can do things like trigonometry and things to get it perfect. Scott Manley did a great video on this if you want to uh, quote-unquote play the game properly. But if you're lazy, like I am, you can just quick save and just do little burns like this and this is ridiculous isn't it don't this is don't take this as part of a tutorial or anything but there we are we can see the surface base there another great reason to have lights on all your ground stations you can easily pick them out um when you're on the dark side of the planet and there we go so if you're interested uh, if you want to see me building this surface base there is a link in the description as well as the end of this video uh the great thing about this surface base it was all built in one launch it wasn't just a monolithic single piece like this video but it was flat packed so it was kind of all stacked up and you know, tightly packed up and then when we got into orbit we un unpacked it and redocked it all in the correct configuration so i was actually quite proud of that video so if you want to watch it in the description but here we are we can go and visit it right now so we can do some science i guess if we want i actually have science from this biome because We've got that surface base there doing science from this biome, so I didn't like need to. But you can see we've got that um, ore processing unit here, so we could have. It probably might have been a sensible idea to build a lander that was able to utilize the refinery. But uh, but hey, maybe we'll do a future video where we expand the station a bit. But yeah, we can just go ahead and visit it, I suppose. But I don't want this video to be too much longer, so we'll we'll just we won't we won't spend much, too much time here, and we'll head back to our lander and head back to the space station. Now you may have noticed on the way down that this lander doesn't have any solar panels or anything. Uh, the reason for this, I mean it probably has enough electric charge to sustain itself without having any power generation, but you see there just like, got highlighted just there. We do have an RTG on here so we can do extended ground missions without having to worry about running out of electricity because it can just generate its own power. So we can just time warp so we're launching not only in the day but also when we've got a nice launch window. And just burn. So I did make a video um, about how to get better at docking but Essentially, all it consisted was F5 and F9, so just quick save, quick load, and just keep doing it until it works. And eventually, you'll get to the point where it's quite easy. I didn't do a particularly good ascent here because we're quickly doing a maneuver node, and we're going to get a pretty close encounter before we've even done one orbit. So, when it comes to rendezvous, it's funny actually, <laughs> the space station is actually the capsule there, and the lander has got the space station icon, so I probably should go back and change that, but there we go. And look at that, so that was end up being quite a nice rendezvous. So the other thing that some of you might be wondering about in terms of this lander is how it's able to have monopropellant and do RCS maneuvers without any monopropellant tanks. The reason for this is all command modules have uh, a small amount of monopropellant storage available to them. So in this case, this particular lander can has 15 units of monopropellant. So loads of room I'm seeing, you can see me doing an absolutely horrendous job 
of uh, docking with the docking port because I kept on accidentally targeting the well setting the autopilot to target and then the magnets kept on throwing it off but eh, whatever we have enough and we have a huge monopropellant tank again just to refuel the lander and we can do that now actually so the orange tank has loads and loads of fuel so we can refuel this loads of times but you can see what we're doing now we could just transfer the Kerbal through but that would kind of be transferring through a fuel tank which seems a bit weird so what I've got is this other docking port here just so we can dock the lander on and the Kerbal can transfer through directly into the space station without needing to go on a, without needing to go on a spacewalk and then when we need to dock it back onto the orange tank the lander has a probe core on it so it can be controlled remotely to dock it back onto the end of the fuel tank that thing it docked to actually that's meant to be the airlock obviously you know a space station in real life would have to have a separate airlock module just for the eva so that's kind of built there to symbolize the airlock and i've done the same thing again doing an absolutely terrible job of docking but now we've refueled the monopellant and have plenty of fuel left over eh it doesn't matter <laughs> i was too lazy to re i didn't do a quick save or anything so i couldn't just revert it so i thought oh, we'll just do it we'll just do it we'll just do it and there we go if you are struggling to get it um to attach sometimes if you just disable sas or rcs sometimes it's just the autopilot things and the sas units fighting against the magnets of the docking port so sometimes that helps just facilitate your docking and there we go just refueling it we've got loads and loads of fuel in the orange tank we actually have enough for about 11 or 12 missions to the surface depending on how fuel efficient you are so i'd love to know if any of you have any success with this and that's the refueling stage done and that's pretty much it so we can actually do a quick overview of the space station using this tracked text here uh, there you go you see the experiments there um, but that's pretty much wrapping this video up so again like i say there is a link to download the craft file in the description if you want to um, I would, I don't tend to recommend downloading craft files for space stations though, just because I think one of the things that makes them nice is that it allows you to kind of express your own creativity and design something that's quite cool. I don't know, that's why I don't, I don't recommend you download the craft file, but I mean if you want just to have that habitation ring, just copy and paste it into a different sub-assembly then fair enough. But, but there we go, just doing our little fly around. And, well, that's it. So, here's a view of it from far away. I really like the way the orange tank actually gives that splash of, that extra splash of colour. But anyway, there's going to be some links on screen now. Top left is another single launch space station to Jewel. Top right is the single launch Elu base we visited. Bottom right is a specially set just for you, so I don't know what that is. And bottom left is the music video version for this mission. And, well, that's it. So, everything else like Twitter is all in the description. And thanks for watching.